And so, yeah, introduce yourself, please. Okay. And, and you, you talk to me. Forget, uh, ignore okay. the camera. This is like a, like a reporter asking you questions, so it's called an off-camera interview. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm the latest Robert Corrin. <laughs> Uh, I was born in 1947, and my father farmed until he died in, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, and you know what, with the mosquitoes, yep, and anytime. All right, I'm Robert Corrin. I was born in 1947, and my father was also Robert Corrin. And he farmed here all his life until he died in 1983. And I farmed with my brother here until 2002 when we sold the farm to the uh, township. Excellent. So let's, let's do that. And anytime. Okay, I, I'm Robert Corrin and I was born in 1947. And my father farmed here until his death. And uh, my brother and I then continued to farm here until 2002 when the farm was sold to the uh, Campton Township and the uh, uh, Kane County Forest Preserve for open space purposes. So behind us it says Robert Corrin Farm 1835, but that's actually the, the horse building, right? Or was that one of the first structures? Um, my great-grandfather moved here in 1835 from what was then Virginia, would now be considered West Virginia. And he established uh, a residence in, in this area. The log cabin he built when he first came here was on the site of the major dairy barn. In the background, you see what we used to call the horse barn. We used to have uh, sm uh, the younger cattle, not the milkers, would stay in there. We would feed and bed them as they grew up and would eventually uh, become adults and replace the cattle that were milking for us at the time. Um, uh, and, and of course you had horses in the horse farm, maybe not when you were a kid, but yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Horses were a major part of this operation until I think the first tractor was purchased around eight, 1930. Uh, so then the horses started to go away. The last horse, I was about five with the last horse that I remember. So it would have been around 1950 or 52 that the last horse was on the farm. Uh, we didn't use them for much at that point. Uh, most of the work was done by tractors at that point. Everything changed after World War II. The old-fashioned smaller farm had to be kind of, uh, you had to modernize. You had to get a, a bulk milking tank if you were gonna milk. Before that, you had been able to put it in cans, keep it cool, and then take it, uh, in the 30s, they used to take it to Wasco where it would go on a train and then be taken to, to dairies where it would be distributed. But uh, after that, it had to go on a, a bulk tank in the, in the farming structure, and then a truck would come and pick it up every day. Mm -hmm. And then you also sold to Oberreich at some point? Uh, in the, uh, I think maybe mid-50s to mid-60s, Oberweiss was the dairy that we sold to. In the late 60s, the Farm Bureau Organization I think it was the uh, Pure, Pure Milk Association, excuse me. The Pure Milk Association developed uh, not, not a union, but a, an association. And Oberweiss would not have any affiliation with that. And father decided to join the Pure Milk Association. So at that point, his, the milk would go to, uh, I think the modern dairy in Elgin. When that closed, it went to the, uh, um, uh, Dean's, which is up in Huntley now, and that's the one we sold to until we stopped selling milk in 2002. So here, I'll pause for a second, and how, how big of an operation was this, you know, back at the turn of the last century? And, you know, g give us an idea of the, of the acreage of, of this parcel and how many uh, dairy cattle at its, at its peak, that kind of thing. I suspect the peak number of dairy cattle were <coughs> uh, at the end when we were milking. You get up to about 50 or 52 at the maximum. I, I'm not sure how big it was at the turn of the century. <coughs> Excuse me. I know uh, in the 1920s they had a problem with the disease that came and they had to sell off almost all the herd. Was that mastitis? Uh, no, not mastitis. It was something more serious. 
I want to say hoof and mouth, but I don't think it was hoof and mouth, but it was something very serious that led to uh, many cattle having to be destroyed. And that uh, maybe it might have been maybe tuberculosis. I'm not, I absolutely am not yeah. sure though. Uh, and, and so that's what they did. They had to kill all the cows and start over. Yeah. Was there any kind of insurance for that? No, no, not. So you literally started from scratch. A great grandfather did not believe in insurance. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it certainly was not as prevalent in life then as it is now. But uh, he he was he was not big in on on insurance in general. Uh, I'm not sure what grandfather's position was by the time you know i got to be i was born we were insured for things for the most part but uh the crops you it's pretty hard to insure against mother nature that's one of the problems give us an idea of the, of the size of this parcel of land that we're that we're on you know and what was farmed when you were a kid all, all the time i was involved it was what it was when we sold it it was the it was 380 acres when we sold it. The parcel down here around this house was, uh, I think, 270 or 75, and the parcel that went with another area was 110 up on the other side of Silver Glen Road, and partially on the west side, to the north of Silver Glen also. That property had been part of this farm at an earlier point, but at some point it was sold. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think. It, uh, the Anderson brothers lived there at the end, and they sold it back to Grandpa right after World War II. Uh, so the total was 380 for both parcels. Um, I'm not sure when they had to sell it. I can't. Uh, that probably the records are available somewhere, but uh, it was all the time I was here. When we were young, we lived on the farm up uh, on the other side of Silver Glen. Grandma and Grandpa lived here with the hired man. And uh, then when Grandma died, we moved down and moved in here. Uh, my brother and I and my mother and, uh, and father. And my Grandpa was still alive for another seven years after we moved down here. Uh, it was kind of the way it was, though the family you know, the grandmother took care of everything around the house. The the grandfather took care of everything out and about, and father was working with him, and they usually had a hired man. The last one we had was William Asherman, and he died in 1969. Uh, after that, uh, father and my brother ran the farm until I came and joined them in 1974. Um, um, not quite sure where to go yeah, now. No, that's great. Uh, all great information. Sure. So there's a, a number of uh, of buildings here. Could you give us an idea of uh, of you know uh, the number of structures and what what they were for uh, here on this campus, as it were? Um, all the structures on the bil the farm were here, except for the one pole barn, which is over uh, next to what used to be the pig house where the pygmy goats are now. That was a storage building that father put up in approximately 1976. Yeah, make it easier, if, you know, we had more tractors or more equipment. Um, the main dairy barn obviously was for milking the cows and storing the feed for the cows upstairs in there. Uh, the milk house is where the bulk tank is there was another milk house which was for the older time and through that the water came up uh, we had a well that came up there which would provide water for the cows uh, you know in a water tank so they could drink during the day and at night always have water is the most important thing you need for any animal um, there's a two corn cribs, one older one and one newer one. The newer one was built in 1960 and it was probably one of the last corn cribs ever built. It's meant to contain ear corn as opposed to the shell corn, which is almost entirely now what is uh, harvested. Um, 
there's a horse barn, which you see in the background. In there, we would park a car. Once we, once we got more drivers than just the mother and father, we needed a second car. So the one car would go in there and another one would be parked near there. Uh, the, uh, the building usually held about 15 uh, animals that were like yearlings. Uh, they didn't need to be fed or anything like milk or they were old enough to, to eat and, and survive on their own, but we would keep them in there, especially in the winter time uh, and at night because the cows, they would use part of the pasture where the cows were and part of the pasture over where the corn cribs are to stay out during the w warmer parts of the year. Um, had to, we had to use a pitchfork to clean those right up to the end. <laughs> and uh, in that barn also we would have some hay and a lot of our straw, which we would use for bedding for both animals. We would also store the, the uh, manure spreader would be in there with the tractor on it. And, and when you would need straw for the dairy barn, you would just toss it into the manure spreader, take it down, toss it in through the doors for the uh, uh, to do bedding for the cat, uh, cows in the barn. Um, there's another storage building over uh, by the corn cribs. That building was a wooden building until 1978. We had like a hundred inches of snow that year and it never melted. Around Valentine's Day the building collapsed. So when it collapsed, we had to clean it all up and father bought another uh, pole barn to put over the concrete floor store, uh, there and, and continue to use it as storage. Uh, right next to that is the chicken house. We would always have chickens. We'd buy like a hundred in the spring, raise, raise them until they were uh, the right size, at which point we would butcher about 50 and that would provide us with our chicken through the year and you'd always get eggs. The rest would have uh, eggs in it. Right next to it was a feed uh, room. You'd get some buckets of corn and oats, what you needed to feed the cattle with. Um, the White House, which was originally built for uh, a hired man in the 1880s, was used for storage also when I was growing up and we would go over and play in there sometimes. I think father actually played in there more than we did when he was young. Was only lived in for the one year. Uh, and other than that, then you have the house which has a garage on the end. I remember one year I parked my car in there but it wasn't used for cars very often. And strategically located a nice distance from the barn. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, you wanted to. You didn't want the smell of the barn to uh, overtake the the place where you lived usually. Although, you know, the smell of the barn is not nearly as bad as some of the other smells we're accosted with now. It never hurt anybody, as far as I know. But, but. Uh, but it was a good idea to keep it downwind or like yeah that. and and the the house is to the west and the prevailing winds are from the south and the west so the you're getting the smell from the house being blown towards the barn rather than the smell from the barn being blown towards the house for the most part good deal okay so so anytime all right oh and forget about the lens you're talking to me. okay yeah. we're here in the horse barn now on the right hand side here we have all the equipment that was used for horses. This was never used by me. I wouldn't know how to set up a horse to do the work, but uh, it is here. We never throw anything away on this farm. Everything has been here for as long as it's been here almost. Uh, then over this shoulder we have the tractor, which was the lifeblood of the operation from about, well definitely from World War II on but beginning in the during the depression when uh, uh, mechanization and cheap oil made it a lot more efficient than using uh, the horses. So let's talk a little bit about uh, this operation then. So you, you've got 50 or 60 head of cattle at a dairy farm. You've got X number of horses. You can kind of estimate that for us. But you also need to grow the, the 
food, uh, the crops, to feed the, the cattle. So kind of give us a sense of that, because a lot of people that are watching this really have never had any experience with, with the farm. Okay, on this farm, we did a rotation of crops. We would rotate uh, corn, oats, and hay for the most part. Later on, we added some wheat and beans, but that was just in the last few years of the farming operation. Uh, the uh, uh, corn, we would do two years on a particular field for the corn, and then we would put oats in the next year. In With the oats, when we, we would put uh, an alfalfa grass seed uh, mixture with some clover in it, to make sure something would grow that the cattle could eat. That would not really appear as food until the year after. There was a, but the oats we would harvest, that's where we'd get the straw for the bedding. And uh, then the next year, and sometimes for two years, we would do alfalfa. The alfalfa would provide nitrogen to the ground, which is absolutely essential for the corn and the corn would use up the nitrogen. So by using this rotation, you would reduce your needs for uh, synthetic fertilizers as much. They, they used to say about farms, you should have uh, one, uh, one acre per animal, per cow, in order to fertilize well with 50 cows and about 270 acres that we would plant to crops that wouldn't work, so we'd have to supplement it with uh, fertilizers over the years, each year. Now, uh, of the 380 acres, approximately 110 were pasture land. The the pasture land uh, it it paid big dividends because the cattle could, you know, they could stay there, they could be outside, they could be more comfortable. Uh, in the spring, especially when the grass was green, that would promote the highest productions of milk at that time of year. Otherwise, other times of the year, the grass is a little bit uh, harsher, not as, as uh, high in nutritional value. Uh, you'd supplement it with hay, which you, depending on the year would be really nice and rich, and other years, not so much. The hay was a difficult product to harvest because you needed three good days in a row. You needed one day to cut it, one day to let it dry, and then another day to uh, uh, get it all raked up and baled up. And once you raked it in the morning after the dew had gone off, then you would bale it in the afternoon and, and throw it uh, up in the hay mows. A lot of work. Uh, it, that was labor intensive. We would usually have to get some younger people to help us a little bit as the years went on, especially. But uh, you'd need a, a driver for the baler, you'd need somebody on the baler, and then you would need somebody to, on, to, drive, to go between the fields and uh, uh, go back and forth between the field and the barn uh, with an empty wagon so you could start loading it again, and then that person would bring it back and unload it, and there would be either one or two people, the two being a nice luxury, to uh, actually put it in the mow in a nice, convenient way. Uh, the the saw, uh, By the way, I saw pictures of like a hay baling competition. What was that all about? I don't know anything about hay baling competitions. I was only interested in getting our hay baled. The uh, uh, back in the 30s, we had a, a loader, uh, a, a, a loose hay baler, sort of, which you can still see in one of the outbuildings. It, it, I never have seen it used. Uh, but then, like dur during World War II or shortly after, there would be people that would buy their own baler, and then they would pay for that by going around and hiring themselves out to bale for people. So. You'd have to have the mower, you'd have to have the rake, and you'd have to have the labor to get rid of the bales of hay, but other people would do the baling. Our first baler was purchased in the 1950s, so then we became able to do the whole job ourselves. So tell us a little bit about uh, um, your life here on, on the farm then. Uh, how soon, how, at what age did you start to actually contribute with, uh, with chores and then you know, kind of give us an idea of, of, as you got a little bigger, what your additional responsibilities were. 
Well, I was pretty lucky. I did not have to, they didn't depend upon me for much. Uh, in, when you're really young, like six, seven years old, you might come down and you might feed the calves. The small calves you would feed, you would put a little bit of milk in. Well, you, for the first few days, you'd give them straight milk because mother's milk is what made the, the calves get their immunities and start to develop. After that, you would water the milk down to the point where you would, you know, maybe have three cups of milk and three cups of water when you started and do that twice a day. So you might feed them and you'd feed them in a small bucket, a tin bucket, and that bucket would, uh, the calves would drink it right up. You'd just stick it under their nose and, and once they learned, sometimes it took them a while to learn. If you did that, you had to put a couple fingers in their mouth for them to suck on and then they, once they started feeling the water and the milk go up uh, through that sucking method, then they would, they would learn quickly to drink. And then by the time they were six months or so, then you just put a little dribble of milk in there and about a half a bucket of water and they would drink the whole thing up in a, a flash. But that was probably the first job I did. The, I, I'm saying probably about eight or nine, there might be one cow that was almost dry. The way the cycle works with the cows, you want them to be dry for a month, which means they're not uh, making milk before they have the calf. Then when they have the calf, then you would milk them. And uh, uh, just before they would go dry, instead of putting the machine on it to milk them, you would milk them by hand. And they might only give, uh, you know, maybe a, a quart of milk or something, just a little bit. It wouldn't take much to do that. So that was probably the first thing I did in the barn, either that or carry milk. But when you're small, you have to carry pretty, s it's a lot of trips. <laughs> you know, you can only carry a small bucket rather than a full bucket. Uh, I probably started driving the baler around 10 or 11. Uh, that was that's an easy job. It's it's uh, you're driving around the field in a circle, picking up the hay at about one mile an hour, because there's somebody on the back taking these bales out. It seems awfully fast to the guy on the back pulling the bales out, but to you on the tractor, it's pretty slow. And there, you know, there there was nothing to run into out there. Just follow the hay and and uh, pick it up. But that, that's probably the first thing, probably then about 12 to 14, you might start unloading the hay, putting it onto the elevator to get it up into the barn where someone would mow it away. And then by the time you're 16 and up, you're doing whatever it took, either loading hay onto the wagon or uh, mowing it away in the barn. Did you have those kinds of responsibilities every day throughout the years? No, uh, I was, with with the hired man, father was able to take care of most things. I don't know how he did it though. When he also was the supervisor of Campton Township from 1941 to 1971, so he was getting out at five o'clock in the morning to milk the cows. Then he would finish about seven or seven thirty. Then he would go in and have breakfast and go out and do chores. Uh, whatever he didn't finish, the hired man or someone else would help with. You'd help on the weekends. You'd clean the calf pens and you know things like that. Uh, but I did not have to do that. There was one time when I was a junior in high school. The hired man got sick, and he was uh, either in the hospital or recovering from something. I never knew exactly what the details were, but he could not help from maybe the middle of August until the first of the year. So on, at that time, I would get up uh, at five o'clock, help father with the milking, you know, do whatever I could. And then when I needed to, I would uh, um, go up, eat breakfast, and then go to school all day. And then I would come home and help with the milking at night, which usually got done about seven o'clock or so. And then uh, um, do my homework go to bed and do the same thing. But that was only for that short time. Other than that, I, would, I played on the baseball team. I was able to do extracurricular activities as well as usually had a full load at school. So, so let's talk a little bit about your, your dad and, and your mom. Uh -huh. um, uh, uh, and 
did they live here with uh, his? Did your grandma and grandpa live with here? So, you know, just kind of talk a little bit about that. Okay, father knew my mother for a long time because I remember them telling me they went to see It Happened One Night at the theater as, as a date. And that came out in 1933. Well, they didn't marry until 1946. So I, I'm a, there were three things that I, I, mean, I never talked to anybody and knew why that was, but there were three things that affected. Uh, one was the depression. You were never quite sure everything was gonna work out right. Then World War II came, and we didn't know we were going to beat Hitler when that happened. And the third thing is, my mother was a school teacher, and school teachers, once they married, were forced to quit teaching. So she wanted to keep teaching, so she taught until actually uh, she did some substitute teaching even after they were married, before the children came along. And uh, like I said, father was supervisor from 1949 to 71, so that would entail meetings maybe a couple days a week, sometimes more in the evenings once in a while. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what kind of time it took, but it would have been hard to uh, manipulate that and still keep the farm going. The hired man was a great help. My brother and I helped some, but and my grandfather helped until he died in 1963. But uh, uh, they had a they had a group. My father went to Elgin High School. He had a chance to he had a choice when he he went ten years to uh, through at Wasco. He started at that school, uh, and then once he got through the ten years, then they didn't have anything uh, for uh, junior and senior year. So he had a choice, he could go to St. Charles, he could have gone to Plato uh, before it became Burlington Central, or he could have gone to Elgin. Well, my aunt, my, his aunt, my great aunt, lived in Elgin and worked at, at the old Ackerman's uh, uh, department store. And she, so he moved there so he could live with her and he would stay there all week when he was like in 1927, 28, I think he graduated in 29. So 1928 and 29, he would stay all week and then he'd come home on the weekends and help with stuff and then go back again. And he made friends there uh, that he stayed friends with all his life. And they and their spouses would meet once a month, uh, once here, once at another, you know, there were like four, four couples. And this, uh, went on until they could do it no more, which was basically 1990, from 1930 or 35 to 1990. Uh, and so th those nights, you know, some uh, usually a Saturday night, so we would uh, go and pitch in a little extra so Father could get away a little bit early sometimes for those. But uh, now Mother was born in Plato Center on a farm, the Muirhead Farm, and she grew up there with uh, uh, four siblings. One, two, yeah, one of whom died at age 15 after an accident on the farm in, uh, it, it, I think, uh, around 1915. That would have been an older sister. Uh, the others all lived to be at least 89. And my mother was the oldest. She would live to be 101. She, when she graduated from high school in 1927, uh, class of 11 from Plato High School, and she and her cousin were co-valedictorians, she went to uh, Wheaton College and got a degree in history. Well, coming out of the, the uh, uh, during the depression, jobs were hard to come by. She did some interviewing around. One of the people she told me she interviewed with was George Thompson, who is, is a big name in St. Charles schools. And he told her basically to see what she could do about finding a job at her old school because it worked really well. And she did eventually, after a couple of years, found a job at Plato High School where she taught English and I think some PE for 15 years before getting married. Uh, and then she assumed uh, 
ran the household, you know, you, if you dropped by, you know, even if the house was a mess, you were invited in, you were given cookies and cake, <laughs> which were always there. Uh, and uh, so it's kind of interesting to see this woman with a master's degree in uh, English literature from Northwestern who was uh, running this household in a way that you would expect not someone with a master's degree in Northwestern to do it. And I had the best proofreader of all. I mean, I would write my book reports or papers, and I would proofread them, and then I you know, would hand them to her, and she would proofread them for me, basically taking my four-syllable words and turning them into one-syllable words, <laughs> because the simpler was the better, usually. And uh, uh, so she raised the three children and uh, was active all uh, starting in the late 19, uh, maybe the mid 1960s. She was a volunteer at the Elgin State Hospital for many years, actually until probably about 2000 when she was in her about 90. And she finally had to give that up. She worked a lot with uh, patients there on GEDs and made many friends there. But she was a Muirhead. She was born. Her her, na her maiden name was Muirhead, and her mother's maiden name was Beeth. So we have three families that go back to at least the 1830s and 1840s that all come together with her. So when people say you've got a road named after you, I say no, three. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, we're gonna take a pause here for a second. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what happened then with the. Uh, uh, initially. Uh, the way milk was marketed, you would you take 50 gallon uh, or 50 pound uh, pay, uh, cans and you would load those up and, and take them to the railroad station to, uh, to send it to market. Uh, you do this every day. And that system was in place until uh, after World War II. After World War II, the, I don't know who, whom it was, the government or the dairies or, or big business or whatever, decided that the system was antiquated and, and endangered people's health by making, you know, uh, n not uh, keeping things cool appropriately. So they uh, developed a system called a bulk tank. They usually, uh, our, our bulk tank is cemented into the floor in a, a little building just adjacent to the milk, to the barn. Uh, that bulk tank is run uh, on a, like Freon or, or some sort of gas, refrigerated, refrigerant gas. So the milk is taken from the cow and it's poured in, through a strainer to strain the dirt out and then into the, the bulk tank where it's cooled to 40 degrees. That's, that's the way the refrigeration works. This system became mandatory after World War II. This, of course, cost a lot of people their dairies because they couldn't afford to buy one. We, we bought one and had it installed and, and uh, the building built on to hold it. And that's the way we took care of milk all the way up through 2002. And then would a truck come to you? Right, and, and with this system now, instead of taking the uh, milk to the railroad, which you know was becoming less and less, the ra rail lines were fewer and fewer and not as available to, for certain things, and this was one of them, then they would bring bulk tanks and they would just drive up and down the road to the dairies and load them in. And uh, this is, when we uh, first started going to Oberweiss is when we did that. Oberweiss is a dairy in Aurora. Uh, and uh, they still are in business and they still, but they still have significant restrictions on what they can, what they will buy. Um, th this bulk tank, uh, you know, it's, it would need a maintenance now and then, but it's got a big paddle in the middle that would stir the milk to keep it to make sure it all got cooled to the same temperature. If you didn't, then you know the, the side next to the outside wall would get cooled, but the stuff in the inside would stay warm. And 
uh, there's a hole, a little hole in the wall with a slide and the milk truck would just run a hose through that and attach it to the end of the tank and suck it out like uh, the sound of a straw, you know, at the bottom of a soda, soda when it got to the end. And then we would have to, we would rinse it always after they were done. They would rinse it generally and we would rinse it a little bit more. And then one, one time a week, we would get in there and we would clean it really good with some strong soaps and, and rinse it really good and to keep it clean because you need to keep it clean even when it's cool like that. That uh, uh, most systems now are uh, uh, pipelines where the milk actually goes into a pipe and it never touches human hands. It goes right through the pipeline and dumps into a tank like that and the same thing happens. Uh, but the, t the, the tank is very similar to the ones that were introduced in the late 40s and 50s. They usually get bigger because they have more cows and the more modern dairies. And, but that investment cost people their, their dairy farms? Uh, they would switch from dairy farms at the time to either beef or pork or or crop rotation, which would usually be beans or uh, corn. And those are the crops that they could sell. Yeah, it, people just didn't have enough money, so they would sell their cows and uh, stop milking, which was a lot nicer for most people because it was less time. But as time went on, you know, then the, the younger generation maybe influenced by World War II where they got out and saw the world, even if it wasn't necessarily the world they wanted to see, they weren't so happy staying home anymore. So they would leave and then with no one in the younger generation to take over, then, uh, then the farm would have to be sold when the, uh, the farmer got too old to do it himself. You and your brother ran this from what year to what year? Okay. I. Uh, I quit a job at the Elgin Library in 1974 and started working. My father was still running the farm at that time. Uh, but at the beginning of uh, January 1st, 1975, my brother and I actually took over. My father was still working and advising us and helping us mid the transition, but we uh, had a contract where we were buying the machinery and the cattle from him, probably at a bargain price, you know, to make sure. but. Uh, so from 1975 until 2002, my brother and I were in partnership on this. And that, that's the way the dairy process ended. And you were, you were still, you know, how many uh, uh, dairy cows did you have approximately? When I, you were I think when we sold at the end, there were about 37 or 38. And uh, a number of heifers and y younger animals ready to move up the line you know you needed to keep them pregnant that uh, once they got pregnant then they moved in and took and if you had spots for them great if you didn't then you you know would have to move an older cow that was perhaps not not producing as much and uh, uh, they would go to market where you would get a, a a price for them never never as much as you'd like you know but <laughs> yeah. but uh, that that's the way the herd was rotated. What did you do with uh, bull calves when they were still? Bull calves we usually sold at a young age. We didn't raise them to become beef. Um, there were people that would come around and buy them. We found other people that would buy them. We took them to markets sometimes. I think at the end they were going to Maple Park. They used to have an auction out there where they'd sell them. And uh, I, some other, I mean, it's various people would buy them over the years for the most part. And what, what breed of cow did you primarily work with? We, we had Holsteins. Now, when we went to artificial um, breeding in 1991, we started getting some red Holsteins too, but they were all Holsteins. Mm -hmm. They were not. Uh, uh, jerseys or Guernseys or anything they were. And why the Holstein? I don't really know. <laughs> it's just the, that's what we had. 
I think it was a popular breed that performed well in this type of climate. Uh, Holstein indicates it probably came from Germany, and I'm uh, thinking, you know, the climate there is similar to what it would be here. So, you and your brother ran all the financials for several decades. Uh, 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 it is, did it become more and more difficult for the, the smaller operations like yours to stay profitable? Yeah, a, um, during the 1970s, there were some subsidies. Uh, the government had some subsidies that kept the price pretty regular. It didn't fluctuate much. So if you made, uh, you know, 100,000 pounds one year, you might get uh, $20,000 for that uh, or 30, uh, you know, S but um, I'm just making up numbers. They have no no basis in reality. But the I'll uh, put that up. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that the income stayed pretty regular. Now, once uh, Reagan was elected in 1981, he started removing those subsidies. So you found that the prices began to fluctuate a lot, and sometimes they would be higher, and sometimes they would be lower. When they were higher, you were always happy. When they were lower, not so much. And the same thing would happen with the price of corn. You know, in order to have a really good crop of, or a really good profit from corn, you needed to have a bumper crop while your neighbor has a, a bad crop. <laughs> you know, you have to, somebody has to do poorly for you to do well, is what it amounts to. Uh, but uh, the, the price, it seemed like, and of course the cost kept going up. So if you could keep your income level, then the price would continue to rise and uh, eventually it got to the point where it was very difficult to make enough money. And, and so did, were you considering selling uh, for a while before you were approached by the township? Perhaps a little bit. Yeah. Uh, n we did not, uh, once the township got that, then we started kind of looking at it. My brother and I were both in our 50s and it was like there was no one to take over. The, uh, uh, my daughter is the only one in the next generation and she was never going to milk a cow. The buildings needed some maintenance and there was simply not enough money to manage that. So when the township offered a competitive price with developers, we took advantage of the opportunity at that point to sell. So um, you had been approached by developers? Uh, n a couple, but not too many. There, there's a lot of things about this land that they didn't like. Uh, the, the zoning would have been five acre lots, but not too many developers uh, approached us. There's a lot of low ground, which they would have to find other uses for than building houses. So, but there were a couple that had made some plans and were thinking about it and made some offers. What's your opinion of the development in the 500 and some homes that are going to go in on McDonald's Road here just to the east of you? Uh, it seems like a lot. Again, some of that's pretty low ground, but I'm sure they have it figured out. I, it, it's, it's just the way the, the world is. I, you Does it know, break your heart a little bit? I don't know that it's, I'm that emotional about it, but it's, you know, you, you always hate to see really rich farmland buried under concrete. You, you, you can grow so many things here so easily and so well, and you have to, and, and once you put a house on it, now you can't grow anything anymore. So you, uh, that's kind of the way I look at it, uh, but it's not, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all almighty dollar here, you know. Whatever people can make off it, they will. And, you know, you, you can't really blame, uh, you know, people when when that younger generation perhaps they've gone off to college and they're not really interested in farming and the parents are are you know can't keep it up anymore or passed away, um, you can you know become an instant millionaire with uh, you know selling that property off to. 
It, yes, if you're lucky. Yeah. Yeah, it's not necessarily that easy, is yeah, it? Yeah, if you're lucky, you can make a lot of money when you sell it. If not, then, you know, then it's, uh, you you still have problems, but, you know, it's, at least it's not uh, the physical. Right. You're paying taxes, you're, you've got structures that need maintenance, and, and you know, things. Well, and the other side of that coin is if you don't sell it before you get to be really weak and old, now your heirs tend to fight over it too. So the way we did it, everybody was on board and it worked out well for us, but. That's great. Um, I, I love the content we have.